Okay, I will just continue. So I will present my recent work on dimension agnostic chain point here. This is an ongoing project with our alumnus Ruming Wang and my advisor Xiao Feng Zhao. In this project, we consider a very classical statistic problem that is a change point testing problem, which can be simply. Is this to next page? Yeah. Not responding to me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it is yeah, responding. Does it matter where you aim it? Maybe I click on the Oh, it's, it's working out. Maybe there is some delay. Okay. So the mathematical formulation of this problem is quite simple. So we have n observations in the p-dimensional space with both temporal and cross-sectional cross dependence. And we're interested in testing whether or not there exists a single chain point in me. And such classical problems has wide application in many areas such as finance, neuroscience, digital cognition, and banking. And I'd like to start my presentation with two simple examples. The first one is a micro array data. In this study, we have several individuals with bladder tumor, and we can plot their log intensity ratio of some chemicals, uh, like measured in 2,000 locus on their genomes. Note that all these patients have has some like same tumor. If we can observe some mean shift at a same locus, then the corresponding locus is believed to be disease related. And here the author of this paper has shown the certain most significant mean shift using the red vertical lines. The next example is about the word trade network. At each time point, we can collect the data about imports and exports between two, any two countries in the world. Using this data, we can detect the underlying connect and trading communities. In each subfigure, we use we mark the countries from the same community using the same color. And by detecting the underlying mean shift in this like 53 like vectors, we will be able to monitor the underlying changes in the world trade, world trade network. So I do not intend to mention more examples, but there is really a rich literature in this area. And most existing work can be divided into two aspects. The first one is low or fixed dimensional. And the second setting is for the high dimensional. Some earlier work in the change point testing problem mostly revolves around a low or fixed dimensional data, which can trace back to the Page's paper in 1950s. But all these methods are designed specifically for the low, low or fixed dimensional data, and it cannot be easily generalized to accommodate the high dimensional data. In recent years, there is a surge of research in the chain point testing problem targeting at the high dimensional data. And I only listed a few of them here. The common issue for the high dimensional method is that they usually require some artificial technical assumptions. Sometimes it's on the like growth rate of dimensionality. Sometimes it's on the ratio between the sample size and dimensionality. But these assumptions cannot be easily satisfied by the low dimensional data. So it's not surprising that there, this, this kind of method may not work well for the low dimensional data. But the real problem is in practice, there is no clear boundary between the low dimensional data and the high dimensional data. Given the random real world data, we can hardly determine whether this data is assumed to be low or high dimensional. And such question has already been raised in this article by King and Randers. So it can be very like attractive if we can propose a dimension agnostic test that can accommodate all the dimensional setting. The concept of dimension agnostic has also been started by King and Randers. In their paper, they, they gave the definition of the dimension agnostic. In their work, they propose a dimension agnostic mean testing pro, um, method for the IED data. The core idea in that paper is sample splitting. So we incorporate their idea and combine it with the technique of self-normalization. 
then we are ready to propose a new dimension agnostic method for the change point testing problem. Note that we have borrowed some idea from their article, so I feel it's necessary to highlight the differences between these two papers. I have summarized some substantial differences in this table. First, the data used in King's paper is just an IID sequence, but we consider a time series that allow for both temporal and cross-sectional dependence. So the situation can be much more complicated because of the dependence. Also, the uh, King and Randas only consider the mean testing problem, which is a typical one sample problem. But the change point testing problem in our work is kind of two sample problem. Additionally, there are some very significant differences in the techniques used in these two papers. Apart from the sample splitting used in King's paper, we still need to adopt the technique of trimming. This is to alleviate the temporal dependence, and, and we will mention more about this later. As for the test statistic, Kim and Rwanda used a classical student tizer, but we use a self normalizer. Additionally, when established the theory, the key, the key tools used in their paper is the point-wise barrier bound conditionally on the projected data. But we need to carry up with some new conditional arguments. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So sorry. Why is change point testing a multiple sample or t-sample problem? Okay, so actually it's to compare the, so first we do not know the exact change point location, but kind of we, are want, we want to test whether the mean, the sample mean of the, like the um, first half is same with the latter half. So, okay, yeah. so that's why it's a two sample yeah. problem. Yeah. But the problem is that actually we do not know where the location is. So we will do it sequentially. So this is the, like the comparison between these two paper. And next, I like to introduce our methodology. Our methodology includes two steps. The first step is splitting and trimming, which is summarized in this figure. We split the original multivariate data into several blocks. The size of each block is determined jointly by a splitting ratio epsilon and the trimming ratio eta. The largest block is X2, which is the one in the middle. The elements in this um, block will be used in the next step. The two parts on the left and right to X2 will further divide it into two pieces. So here we need to adopt the technique of trimming to accommodate the underlying temporal dependence in, in, uh, in the data. I do not want to dive deep in the like, theory part, but as a direct consequence, these two blocks marked in blue will be excluded from the next step. Step two can be summarized as projection. Using the split sample, we can obtain a mean estimate based on the first block and the last block, and we denote these two estimates by mu1 hat and mu1 hat. Note that the difference between these two estimates. It's very close to the underlying mean shift in the original multivariate data. With a properly selected transformation function d, we will determine a projectional direction. When, it, when the data is, a, when the alternative is a dense change, we directly use the identity function. But when it comes to a sparse change, the case becomes a bit more complicated and we can express our projectional direction as new hat. In brief, new hat corresponds to the component in which we observe the largest mean shift. After determining this direction, we will project this vector along every element from X2. And by doing so, we will get a sequence of projected data denoted by YJ. And a very exciting point is that YJ is a scalar, so it's just a one-dimensional data. So here I like to talk more about our selection of um, direction. Note that in practice, we do not have prior knowledge regarding the sparsity of the data. So we can hardly determine whether to use the dense test or the sparse test. So we recommend to use a Bonferroni test based on both the dense and sparse test. We look back to the 
to this illustrative figure. As I have mentioned, the difference between muon hat and muon hat quantifies the underlying mean shift in the original multivariate data. And such mean shift is well preserved in the projected data. So in other words, to detect the mean shift in the original data, now it's kind of equivalent to detect the mean shift in the projected data, which is a one dimensional data. Hi. D, um, actually, I use D to represent the transformation function, just a function. Just a function. So when, it's, when it comes to a dense change, D is just identity function. And when it comes to a sparse change, we cannot explicitly express D as some like simple function, but we use new hat to represent the result of this function. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is our main methodology. So after obtaining this sequence of scatters, like which is a one dimensional data, we can directly follow the procedures proposed by Shaozhong 2010 to define a Q-sum statistic TNK and a self-normalizer VNK. With these two auxiliary statistics, we are ready to compute our test statistic, which is denoted by G and as shown in equation 3.3. Mm -hmm. So are we taking the change point in the middle data, only x1? So originally we have, sorry, x2. Uh, originally we have like, um, the, like a, a entire sample denoted from x1 to xn and we split into five blocks. The central block is we use the same, uh, like we, we first exclude these two pieces to alleviate the temporal dependence. And we estimate, uh, we obtain the mean estimates based on the first block and the last block. And we, based on these two mean estimates, we find a projectional direction and we will project this, that direction along the elements in X2. So after the pro projection, the elements in X2 were turned into a sequence of scatters, which is denoted by YJ. So originally we want to detect the main change point in X, but since this like projection can keep all the underlying structure of the data. So now it's, so it's just equivalent to detect the change point in Y. And this makes things much more easier because Y is a y, one dimensional data. And we have many existing work for the one dimensional data. Is this clear to you now? Or do you have any follow up question? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So maybe we can discuss about this, this later if you still have any questions. Okay, so now we have introduced how to get our test statistics. So it's very natural to establish some theories for this. Throughout this um, project, we consider three data structures with different dependence um, properties. The first one is a stationary sequence with a fixed dimensionality P. The second case is a linear process. Epsilon T here is ID sequence with mean zero and covariance matrix gamma. And we use AJ to denote a sequence of coefficient matrix. The, the third case is a static factor model. And the factor is char characterized by the P by S matrix lambda. So S here is assumed to be a fixed integer dominated by P. And I just want to quickly mention that to some extent, the static factor model can be viewed as a combination of a stationary sequence and a linear process. But I, I do not have enough time to include more details here. Note that we only assume P is fixed for the first case and for the next two data generating processes, we allow P to go to infinity. For all these three data structures, we have derived the limiting null distribution and we summarize our theoretical results in this table. We first look at the third column where the key assumptions are, some, uh, are presented. For the fixed P stationary sequence, we mainly use Donsker theorem. But for the linear process, we require the coefficient matrix AJ to decay exponentially in their spectral norm. And additionally, we require the error covariance matrix lamb, um, gamma to be constrained by the sample size M. 
And the assumptions used by the factor structure can be viewed as a combination of those from the previous two cases. Uh, as I have mentioned, because the factor structure is kind of a combination of stationary sequence and a linear process. So this is like kind of intuitive. The most exciting finding from this table is that for all these dimensional settings, the a test statistic GN converges to a same pivotal limited distribution G. So this verifies that our method is dimension agnostic because it can accommodate all this like dimensional setting. The explicit expression for G is also provided here. So since this is pivotal, so we can use Monte Carlo replication to simulate G's empirical distribution. And by doing so, we will get its critical value. So at the significance level alpha, we reject our null hypothesis if the value of G exceeds the one minus alpha quantile of G. So this is how we can carry out our test. So next, we also look into the power behavior of our test. So here we only consider a single dense alternative and the mean shift here is quantified by delta. We, um, for a, like, to make it more convenient, we use big delta to denote the quantity square root of n times delta. Again, we can summarize our theoretical results in this table. So something in common is that for all these three data structures, the asymptotic power can be divided into three different regimes based on the magnitude of the mean shift delta. So although the, like the magnitude of delta is like characterized in different way, but two common trivial cases are when delta is uh, when the mean shift is ne it's neither it's either too weak or too strong. In these trivial cases, the asymptotic power goes to alpha or one respectively. A more complicated case is when the mean shift is neither too strong nor too weak. In this case, the asymptotic po uh, power goes converges to some value between alpha and one. So actually in our manuscript, we have already derived the explicit expression for this asymptotic power, but it is quite tedious and lengthy. So I, I, I like to skip this part in this talk. Okay, so far I have talked about our theories and all our theoretical results are supported by our simulation studies. So, so now we can look into the finite sample performance of our method based on an L1 process. For our method, we report the results of the dense test GN2, the sparse test GN infinity, and the Bonferroni test I have mentioned earlier. As for the comparison, we adopt the new um, statistic based trimming method proposed by Remy Wang. Uh, table 6.1 gives the empirical size when the sample size n is fixed at 200. So we first look at our method. So in this case, we can notice that under most situations, our method has already achieved very high size accuracy. It's, but the only exception is when the AR coefficient rho is relatively larger. Note that uh, Reming's method is designed for the high dimensional data. And in their paper, they require some technical assumptions between the sample size n and the dimensionality p. So which cannot be satisfied for the low, um, by the low dimensional data. So it's not surprising that we observe some noticeable size distortion for zero method. When the sample size n increases to 800, we see a significant improvement in our size accuracy. So in this case, the size of the proposed method, are, I, I can say it's very stable and accurate across this table under all the dimensional settings. But there is, not like very significant improvement in the trimming method. At the end, I like to quickly cover our power results against a dense change and a sparse change. Figure 6.1 plots the power curves against a single dense change. So there are many curves, so I like to quickly introduce each of them. So we first look at the central part of each figure. The red curves correspond to the dense test and the green curves corresponds to the Bonferroni test. And we use dotted lines and solid lines to distinguish different 
trimming parameters. We can see in all the situations, these two methods have a very comparable performance and both of them outperform the uh, sparse test, which is like marked in yellow. Not that we have a single dense change in this case. So this actually matches our expectation. In the upper part of each figure, the blue and the purple curves correspond to a uh, running streaming method. And when compared to their method, we see there is some um, power loss. But when it comes to the sparse change, our method like surprisingly gains some advantage. So in this several situations, we can see the Bonferroni test and the sparse test can beat all the other methods. So this, this several cases corresponds to the data structure that has some uh, strong cross-sectional dependence. So this can show some advantage of our method. So at the very end of this talk, I need to quickly recap the contents. So first, we proposed a new test for the single change point testing problem. And by deriving the limiting knot distribution, we can show that our method is dimension agnostic. That means it can accommodate all the dimensional settings. We also look into the power behavior against a local dense alternative. And based on the simulation results, our method can achieve more accurate size under different settings. But the main uh, disadvantage is that we, we can have some slight power loss under certain situations. But in general, the final sample performance is still very encouraging. Here are some references used in this talk. And that's all for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. So I will be more than happy to take any questions or comments. Your method handle a single change point, but the change point occur at different time point of the um, projector. I mean, like for the first time series, it happens at T1. For the second time series, it happens at T2. For the first time series, it happens at T3. And then you model T3 as a multivariate time series. Can you detect it? Oh, actually, actually uh, maybe we were talking about different problems. So here we focus on a single time series. So we only yeah, but got... You're... Mm -hmm. Your time series is a multivariate time series. Yeah. So oh, I got your point. Of the, I mean, of the first univariate, of the first component uh -huh. happens at T1, and the second component happens at T2. So what you are talking about is actually a sparse alternative. The sparse alternative means the mean shift only occurs at a specific component. So I, I guess that matches what you're talking about, right? So you mean, at a single location, we only observe some significant mean shift in certain component. Yeah, yeah this corresponds to the sparse alternative. So actually, this means the change is sparse because it only so occurs. What you mean is that for that kind of problem, it is still a multiple change point and the sparse alternative. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what if the uh, change point occurs at very early part of the country and you misspecify it? At yeah. So mean, this. It's a, this can be a potential um, like issue here. So actually, by default, we assume that the change point does not occur at the very beginning or the very end of, this, uh, of the sequence. Actually, this assumption is like what it is used in many articles. So like most existing work assume that the change point only occurs in the like middle of the like sequence. So you're right. So suppose the like the um, Suppose the change point occurs very early, and note that we use a we have used a splitting ratio and trimming ratio. So it can be it can be a case is that if the change point happens zero, so we cannot detect it because we use this sample to get a mean estimate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, fantastic talk. <laughs> Thank you. So from what I understood, you got rid of your dimension, high dimension P yeah. by this technique of projection, right? Yeah. To convert your data into one dimension. Yeah. So your results could depend on the quality of that projection, right? So where is that term? Yeah. So you mean the projection? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we are, I, 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 I'm not familiar with this uh -huh. thing, so I don't know anything about it. So uh -huh. I'm guessing that this projection the quality of this projection to yeah. turn our multidimensional data into unidimensional data yeah. matters, right? Yeah, of course. So uh, in our theoretical result, where is the where is the term which controls the goodness of this projection? So 
actually, I believe so. If I uh, if my understanding is correct, you mean a good projection must like preserve all the chain point structure. So that's why we use this two specific direction. So actually, this can be monitored by selecting a good direction, right? So actually, we we this we determine the projectional direction in these two ways, targeting at a dense change and a sparse change, and this two projectional method can uh, ha having like proved to be like good to use. Right. So, uh, so can you go to the assumption uh, you presented about assumption? Yeah. The next after this. Yeah. So I. What, what was the gamma term? Which the gamma here, so the gamma here occurs in the linear process is the, so, so linear the linear process, we have a sequence of uh, a, an ID sequence and the covariance matrix of this sequence is gamma. So actually this gamma is not the long run variance of the sequence. So it's, it's only the covariance matrix of the ID sequence in this linear process. What's that? Is it P by P matrix? Yeah, sure. So, uh, so please go to the next page. When you assume Frobenius norm of that P by P matrix is bounded above, you are you assuming something on P? Uh, you mean this sampling or the previous one? No, no, the second one. Yeah, I'm starting to please bro. No, but uh, yeah, of course, actually. Is, Actually, like P is implicitly like appear in this constant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. sure. But know that so the on the left hand side we have row two m two over four and m two. Uh, I can go back a little bit and m two actually is m minus m one. So it is depend on n. Yeah. So m depends on it. That's fine. Yeah. But I'm just thinking that. Uh, that particular assumption, I mean, somewhere you got rid of P and uh -huh. I'm just trying to think how, how like, how, would, because yeah, it only enters through projection. So somewhere P should appear. I mean, and that's where only I can see P appearing. Yeah, like actually this- Not explicitly, of course. But, yeah, I like, I, I acknowledge that P implicitly appear in this assumption, but this assumption is still very mild because you can see on the right hand side, it's approximately of, um, of order n. But on the right hand side, we have a, like exponential term. So this decays very fast. This decays very fast because it's like kind of row to the power of n. So this decays much faster than n. So, so in general, this, this can be able to constrain the for a business norm of gamma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Okay, thank you again for your attention. Okay, just some announcements before we go. First, okay, three announcements actually. Uh, if you like these talks, the slides for them, 